so good evening everybody so we have heron dot will be starting exactly at 6 o'clock so thanks for all the audience for being here so now we'll have dr ajay uh, will he'll be taking over and he will be welcoming dr martin and starting the session for dr ajay thank you sir first i am thankful to the, all the participants and i welcome them for uh, sparing their valuable time to attend this seminar uh, this is the second topic in the webinar series uh, from provet pharma private limited so first uh, webinar was on uh, symbiotic and gut health uh, so for this uh, webinar uh, we are having uh, dr martin with here with us so he is not a stranger now in india so but still uh, i i would like to reintroduce him like uh, dr martin de gusen he completed his dvm from uh, kent university in belgium in 2000 and worked from jason animal health alpharma and he is now uh, managing director in vetworks and uh, he is a general manager for vet farm uh, his specialty is poultry health coccidiosis gut health respiratory disease epidemiology mycoplasma and what not so he is uh, giving the training uh, and uh, he is in his institute so as you all are fully aware that uh, about 60 to 70% disease in poultry are of respiratory origin so maintaining respiratory health is a key in all type of operation related be broiler breeder or layer uh, that's why we kept the topic today is managing respiratory diseases in poultry uh, uh, i welcome uh, dr martin uh martin it's over to you now thank you thank you so much for this uh, very kind introduction and also thank you again um, for uh, inviting me um to this um, yeah lovely uh, idea of having a webinar for uh, for uh, for the indian um, poultry market um i know it's evening for you guys so uh, i'm very yeah happy that you still take the effort uh, although it has been a long working week yeah, to still um uh take your time and listen to uh my talk this uh, evening so um indeed um respiratory diseases uh, in poultry are um yeah are very important um i have to say that in some instances in some countries the um the importance of respiratory disease has has been decreasing um and then usually what happens is that gut health issues are taking over okay that is really depending on the region and eh? so if you look to to countries like new zealand um, iceland uh, scandinavia um countries that are isolated eh? they will have typically a low pressure for respiratory diseases eh? if you go to areas like western europe benelux um a lot of places in in india eh? um china um uh, asian countries typically we have a very dense um um yeah dense poultry population we also have a lot of respiratory issues and depending on the country if you talk about respiratory diseases people will say it's not relevant for us eh? and then gut health would become really important some other countries respiratory health high mortality rates this is the key uh, before we can talk about really performance about feed conversion rate body weight gain you need to solve this uh, respiratory health and i will try in only less than an hour today i will try to to show you the key points of what to focus on if you talk about respiratory disease in uh, poultry so i will give you an introduction talking about the impact of respiratory diseases and you work in the poultry industry you know that eh? um but everything starts with paying the right level of attention to prevention of any disease and especially with respiratory diseases eh? because if you don't do good prevention and that is covering climate management biosecurity vaccination boosting immune system eh? in the poultry sector if you don't pay attention to your prevention you always come too late if you have a flock if you today you say i have flocks where i have respiratory issues the first thing that you have to do for your next flock is to double check your prevention okay so it's always a shame if we have to deal 
with treatments, if you have to deal with uh, outbreaks, okay? Anyway, it can happen uh, that we have not foreseen a certain problem. So you have to treat the, the, the pathogen. Eh? We have different things here, antibiotics, antimintics, fungicides, eh? uh, but very often forgotten in the respiratory issues is that we also have some symptomatic treatments, all right? So I will come to that. And at the last part of the presentation, I will, I will just show you a case report. Eh? Um, I'm not disclosing yet what the case report will uh, deal about, but I will share with you a case report. Now, if you look at this uh, uh, slide here, um, most people will recognize this clinical disease on the right side of the slides as the more important type of respiratory issues. Okay? Why? It is linked to um, yeah, mortality, easy to recognize, trade barriers, uh, you have a cost of treatment, usually with antibiotics, eh? uh, you have a lot of performance loss, the birds are sick, they don't eat anymore, they have a slower growth, eh? and also we have a cost of implementation of monitoring program and prevention, but that has not been paying off. Eh? So most people will easily recognize importance of respiratory diseases when they see a clinical disease, okay? It's already getting more difficult if you talk about subclinical diseases. Eh? So, because there eh, we have a some level of mortality, maybe you can consider it as a normal level of mortality. What is a normal level of mortality? Eh? Is it is it two percent? Is it five percent? Is it ten percent? That is, of course, an important question you have to ask yourself. Um, it will depend also on the region, right? In some regions where you have endemic Newcastle disease or low pathogenic AI it's going to be a really a good, good situation if you can manage to keep your mortality below 5%. Okay? Um, if you don't have pressure of Newcastle disease and AI, yeah, I think a mortality rate below 3% it should be your objective. Okay? So that really depends on, 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 on where you are and what region you are. Okay? Um, Subclinical disease, try to assess that because the losses of, um, if you have that mortality level that you want to achieve, yeah, you still have performance losses. There is a high cost in that. And you have to balance that out with the cost of your monitoring program and your prevention program. What I mean with that is that if you see that you're losing performance because of um, subclinical respiratory diseases, it means you should invest more in monitoring and prevention. Okay. If you have your performance perfect, okay, you, you met your targets, you have good feed conversion rates, good average daily growth, low mortality, you still have to check because you come in the susceptible phase here. You should make sure that you don't overspend your monitoring costs okay, and your prevention. You have to check how much vaccination should I do? How much antibiotic treatments should I do for prevention? For instance, for mycoplasma? How intensive should I monitor my flocks with uh, serology, PCRs? So in each of these cases, you have to keep thinking, how can I optimize my economic return of my approach? All right? So it's not because you say, I don't have clinical disease, that you don't have to understand and look at uh, respiratory diseases. All right? Now, compared to gut health issues, we have one big advantage with respiratory diseases. Respir respiratory diseases are often easy to recognize, all right? So you have mild signs of a little bit birds that have a little bit too much fluid in the eyes, and you can see the nose a little bit dirty, so there's some nose flow and dust will be sticked into the nose. To birds, but here you can already see the sign, eh? Two birds that have obvious signs of respiratory disease. You see the very dirty nose because there's a lot of, of fluid um, discharge that then will uh, uh, allow dust to stick into it. You have the swollen um, uh, suborbital uh, sinuses. Eh? You can see here a swelling and you can see, of course, the eyes are closed. Um, uh, so this is a, a very heavy uh, case. And then it can even get worse eh? where you really have the swollen head uh, syndrome a type of animal that is very easy to recognize, okay? Here, everyone will be agreeing with me that there is an issue respiratory. Here, it could be that people don't see. That is 
still very important and interesting uh, to detect the problem at this early stage because that is of course a much more efficient case to treat eh, compared to this case here in this case this bird will not will not drink anymore it cannot it cannot see the it cannot go to the drinking line anymore the only thing you can do is take um, and inject with antimicrobials okay it's much better to try to recognize the disease in a very early stage so train your staff to be able to recognize that this is the example of, of the image of the bird. You can also use your ears, okay? Um, a good farmer, a good veterinarian, uh, will listen to a flock, and uh, will listen for a while uh, to understand if there's a, a noise, uh, and also to see if um, what kind of noise we hear. Because very um, luckily for us, for well-trained people, you can hear the difference between types of um, airway problems and you can try to find the location of the problem. For instance, if you have sneezing animals, then uh, with occasional head shake and there's occasional sneezing, you know it's gonna be an upper respiratory tract problem, okay? If you have the snuffling with runny nose, watery eyes, we already see, like in this case, a more persistent infection. You have cuffing or rattling that indicates you have all production of mucus in the trachea, eh? then you know your trachea is infected. And then you have this very annoying, very um, um, yeah, uh, unpleasant sound that you can hear in some uh, chicken flocks or turkey flocks, eh? where you have the screeching or the squealing of the animals. Um, they, yeah, when you hear it, you, you, you almost shiver from, uh, from uh, the, the sound alone. If I hear that, oh my goodness, I, I, I suffer together with the chickens that I'm, uh, I'm trying to treat. Um, this is indicating they are almost suffocating because they have, a, they have a mucus plug in the trachea. These birds become short in oxygen. So you know before you open uh, the birds that they will have a severe inflammation of the trachea. So easy to recognize. Eh? So, so with, with, with just using our eyes and ears we can already learn a lot about the etiology the origin of the problem okay so that's that's a big difference with with, with, with gut health because in gut health basically yeah if you have a tenella outbreak you will see bloody feces uh, um, maybe some histomonas case you can recognize because it's very yellow with uh, uh, feces but for the rest it's not so easy to find uh, the cause of um, the intestinal um, um, issues if you only can look at the, the, the fecal matters. Okay, so we, we, we have a lot more clues of the etiology when we look at respiratory uh, infections. Now, the effect of an infection, and, and, and we are in, in, let's say, historic times that also the human population has great attention to a respiratory problem that we know for many years already in poultry production, a coronavirus. Hey, you know that, that infectious bronchitis is caused by a coronavirus as well. Um, but what is maybe understated also or in the light in this whole human pandemic is that, that there's a huge variation in the consequence of the infection, not only by looking at the strain, which is in this case a COVID-19 strain, but also by the route of infection. If you have a person inhaling or an animal inhaling in a fine aerosol, a coronavirus, or you have a person inhaling large particle size, or you have even an ingestion by the oral route, yeah, because, you know, coronaviruses don't only affect the respiratory tract, but also the intestinal tract. We know that very well in the poultry production because we use respiratory IB vaccines also in drinking water. Yeah? And maybe these human doctors don't realize that so well. Yeah? But the infection route will define a lot if you will see a clinical outcome or a subclinical outcome or no outcome at all. Okay. And the other aspect that I don't see people talking a lot is the infectious dose. Yeah? That is why... We had dramatic outbreaks here in Europe eh, in the season where everything is still cold. They asked the people, please lock yourself in the house. And what people do when it's cold, they close the windows. Okay? And that is causing 
a lot of problems of infectious doses that increase a lot because they would put families together and they would start to, to infect each other with very high levels of virus. Okay, so remember for a pathogen, the strain is important, but most people, they only look at the strain, but the root of infection, infectious dose is gonna be very important elements to define the difference between serious problems or less serious problems or just a simple immunization, okay? And then we have some host parameters, eh? age and sex, species and breeds, other diseases, nutritional status, immunity and physiological status. Eh? You will see that for um, any host pathogen interaction, this, this plays a role, but we will see that for respiratory diseases, mainly the intercurrent diseases are gonna be crucial to understand why we see some problems and why we don't see some others, okay? We know that the poultry business is a penny business, so we are really interested in not only controlling that clinical disease, we also want to control the subclinical disease and we want to uh, make monitoring and prevention programs as efficient as uh, possible. Um, we are moving from a situation where we were focusing on clinical losses mainly in order to um, uh, try to solve them. We are not happy anymore when we have um, no clinical loss anymore. We are only happy when we have good idea of uh, subclinical losses and that we can stop the subclinical loss and we can have a, an efficient and cheap preventive monitoring program, okay? That is where we have to focus on. If you are still in the phase of clinical losses, you have a serious problem because it will be very hard for you to compete with companies that have better control, okay? So this is, um, um, it's not possible to have a viable poultry industry if you still suffer clinical losses from a prevention. Again, if you have it, you really urgently have to um, take action and review everything uh, that is related with this disease, okay? So understanding respiratory issues as a complex problem is important. Um, understand this is a multifactorial etiology. I hear so many veterinarians or production managers say, oh, I know what is the problem. I can see it from a distance. It is E. coli or it is mycoplasma or it's IB. Usually, this is a large simplification of the situation. Okay, of course, AI, Newcastle disease are pathogens that can cause the problem on themselves. Okay, if it's a, if it's a high pathogenic strain. Yeah? But even with the low pathogenic strains, if you have a low pathogenic AI, it should not be a problem. If this AI is coming alone, it should not be a problem. But the problem is that usually there are some other things around that make the part of low pathogenic AI problematic. If it's a multifactorial etiology, you can hope to solve everything in one day, but it will not happen. Okay, so you have to think, where is my low hanging fruit and where is my high hanging fruit. And of course, you have to start dealing with the low hanging fruit before you can go to the high hanging fruit. Okay. You have to ask yourself the question, disease control and prevention, yeah? how can I optimize it? I see a lot of companies, they had an old break five years ago, or they had consistent old breaks, high mortality rates. They started vaccinating with hot uh, vaccines for Newcastle disease. And five years later, the epidemiological situation has changed completely. There's no high pressure anymore of uh, Newcastle disease. And they still have a program like they are going to war. And then, of course, the birds suffer from, from other problems like vaccination reactions or um, uh, uh, slow growth, poor feed conversion rates. Eh? And they have a high cost for their preventive program. You have to evolve. Every few months, you have to have a really good look at your monitoring and preventive programs and try to adapt it to optimize the return on investment, okay? And then the hardest part. The hardest part is management and biosecurity. Why? Because for veterinarians, to design a good vaccination program is not the hardest part, okay? But to motivate the people working in the farms, to motivate them, to do what they should do. This is the really tough job, okay? So to know the disease, to recognize it, that is the easy part. But to have management and biosecurity uh, guidelines implemented on the farms 
sometimes with people that are not so well paid, that is the big challenge. And we have to help them to understand how to do that. Okay. Respiratory issues are mainly airborne. Um, that is a disadvantage because we have also wild birds flying around. So they can, they can take it with them and they can infect from one farm to another farm. Um, yeah, so uh, we do know that once you have solved your respiratory issues, eh, intestinal problems are going to be more important. Eh? And why do we see in most countries, we see that intestinal problems become more important than the respiratory? Because we have some really easy things going on with respiratory issues. We can target them quite easily with vaccination. Okay, It's usually when a pathogen is going through the trachea and going to deeper respiratory organs or passing the trachea, if that happens, eh, then we have usually respiratory issues. And fortunately for us, the immune system can easily, most in most cases, can quite easily cope with that. Even for very nasty diseases, like AI or Newcastle disease, we know if it would be allowed, or if we, in some cases we have, like Newcastle disease, we have good vaccines, we know that we can go from from unvaccinated birds that would die to birds where nothing will happen. Okay, so that indicates that vaccination is quite easy, much more difficult for intestinal issues. Yeah, um, yeah. so remember, eh, clinical problems should not be there anymore in most cases because we have the tools, the immune system to cope with them. So today's clinical losses are the most costly ones and correct diagnosis will be um, the key. So a lot of respiratory diseases are not a big problem if they come alone, but remember, they never come alone. Yeah? And I give you here a list. Uh, this list, you, you can, if you want, you can add for me, you can add other pathogens. Uh, if you have a certain uh, a region, you have that uh, other pathogens. But th these are really the most important um, viruses, bacteria, fungi, and, and we also have some respiratory parasites that can cause problems um, in uh, poultry. And um, if you look at this list, eh, what is remarkable is that some people will say, oh, I have problems with ORT. Others will say, oh, I have problems with infectious bronchitis. Oh, I have problems with, with, with Avibacterium paragallinarum. Oh, I have problems with, with uh, E. coli. Yeah? But usually they don't understand that very often before you see that E. coli, that the E. coli has only been able to, cr to claim a place in that bird because, for instance, a very poorly detectable pathogen like Mycoplasma synoviae was able to create, to pave the way for the E. coli, right? the E. coli which is very visible. Right? And maybe the Mycoplasma synoviae, yeah, if there would no, uh, if there would not be an infectious bronchitis challenge, this Mycoplasma synoviae would not be so damaging and would not be able to help the E. coli to cause mortality. And maybe we didn't even notice the E. coli, maybe we have seen the more spectacular ORT that is uh, following after that E. coli damage, okay? And what is your job? Your job is not to diagnose the ORT or the E. coli. Your job is to understand how much of this problem is caused by MS, or infectious bronchitis, or Newcastle disease, etc. That is your job. So if you think you have a simple answer, it's probably not going to be the complete answer. Try to remember that. Okay. So if you have a veterinarian who says, "I know where it is. It's E. coli," you have to ask this veterinarian. Okay, but I want you to understand how can this E. coli cause the problem? What is below? Okay, and usually. There is other things going on that have to be improved. All right. Okay. So prevention. Um, yeah. The first possible prevention that you can have is to reduce the pathogen load in the house. I already compared with the coronavirus in humans. Eh? Um, this is exactly the first uh, thing that we also do in production of, of, uh, of poultry. Okay. So consider that we deal with the flock. Eh? So not all the birds get sick at the same time. So there is a couple of birds that get 
a certain amount of pathogens in. If you go, one virus is not enough. One bacterium is not enough to cause the problem. You need a certain amount to have the first birds starting to, to have this infection going on and being able to excrete enough virus or bacteria to start contaminating other um, uh, flock members, right? So you have to realize that by ventilation, you can really dilute that um, virus or that uh, bacteria. You have to be careful, of course, especially in colder climates eh? um, or during the night. Eh? Also in India, the nights can be, can be cool in some areas. Um, that, of course, that you are not causing problems with too much ventilation that can also cause um, uh, stress to the innate immune system at the level of the trachea. But remember that ventilation is going to be a very um, good tool to dilute your pathogens in the house. Be careful. Because you are usually not a farm on your own. Eh? This here is a picture of a study that was done in uh, Northern America. And what you see here is arrows eh? are indicating in tunnel ventilated farms the direction of where the ventilation has been uh, is, is blowing the air out of the farms okay and you will see that very often you will be able to to have um in some cases they will be in isolated the the, the 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 plume what we call the plume of the exhaust of that farm of that house eh, is not going to be touching other farms but in some cases and this is an example of AI, you will see that these farms are blowing air with virus, in this case it was AI virus, with a virus and with the dust are blowing from one farm into another farm. And this farm can again contaminate another farm. So realize that, eh? that farms can contaminate each other and if you increase your ventilation <laughs> when you have a problem because you have an outbreak, that you could also be contaminating your neighbors, okay? So remember that. Something that we do, so ventilation is one option uh, to dilute the pathogen load in the house. Another one is very simple. Very often we can use uh, disinfectants in the house, eh, fogging disinfectant with the birds in the house, antiviral, antifungal, little treatment. You have to check in your local legislation if that is allowed. But in most countries, you have at least some uh, disinfectants that are allowed to be used in presence of, um, of even of humans eh, or even of, uh, of animals as well. Eh? So, but that could be a way to reduce this uh, pathogen load, something that is quite uh, used quite a lot. Okay. So, um, yeah, um, you have to uh, see ventilation as a main factor that's tiered respiratory health, but um, today. We all not only look at, um, at ventilation when we talk about respiratory health, but we also want to have other indicators that, um, that help us to understand uh, what is going on with respiratory health. Eh? So, so um, we do also want to uh, check if the daily weight gain is going okay, if the water intake is going okay, we check water quality and feed intake um, as tools to also monitor uh, uh, the impact of uh, respiratory diseases. Yeah? Okay, if you look at um, biosecurity, uh, um, and I know it's a, it's a word that most farmers don't like. Biosecurity is just, it's a waste of time. It's rules, it is slowing down my work, uh, and you cannot see if it has an effect or not. So this is one of the things that is the most difficult. If you, if you tell a farmer, okay, you have this disease, I have a good vaccine, you put it in the drink water, you, you solve the problem, he says, ah, I like it. I like this. You know, it's not a lot of work and I, I have a good result. But biosecurity, this is every day slowing down the farmer or the veterinarian, yeah, because maybe the farmer is doing a good job, but I can tell you, I'm a veterinarian myself. I can tell you, some veterinarians really don't like to follow the biosecurity rules. They say, oh, I only come here on this farm once every two weeks. It doesn't matter if I follow the biosecurity rules or not. Okay, I just, I just don't 
don't don't bother. Happens very often. And of course, veterinarians are going from one flock to another flock. So it's extremely crucial that they give the good example of biosecurity. Poultry farms are getting bigger and bigger. We also see that the most cost-effective way to prevent disease is by keeping them out. But uh, we see that uh, biosecurity is a critical factor in animal welfare and, and disease control, but is also one of the most uh, difficult uh, things to, um, to motivate people in, okay? If you look at pathogen transmission and we look at biosecurity, you have to remember there's two ways of pathogen transmission. One is the vertical way. So we have parents and they will transmit uh, uh, the disease with the protogeny. What is the best known example for that in respiratory health? It is mycoplasma, okay? Mycoplasma has a fantastic capacity to be transmitted from the mother hen to the progeny in the, uh, by the day old chick, okay? A lot of diseases are more easily transmitted by horizontal transmission. Okay, um, and horizontal transmission, most people would think of direct transmission. One chicken sitting next to another chicken, the first chicken infects the second chicken. Biosecurity is going to focus on this indirect horizontal transmission, yeah, um, where through materials, dust, feed, drinking water, vector, transport, humans, yeah, we are going to have a transmission of a disease. Yeah? And most pimp people don't bother thinking about uh, that route too much, okay? Who can transmit a um, disease? Who are vectors? Humans. Number one, humans. Who? The vet. Who? The feed supplier. These are the people that are the most likely to transmit the diseases, okay? Domestic animals, yes but in a lesser extent, okay? Everyone likes to point to, oh, the wild birds are doing the, no, yes, yes, it's important. But humans are more important, okay? Uh, wild animals, uh, insect parasites, uh, the air, as I explained, if you're in the neighborhood of, uh, of other farms, feed, water, materials, vehicles. We had last year, we had an outbreak of um, low pathogenic AI here in Belgium. Um, uh, a nice uh, case where, 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 where we also published about that and you can find some work that we did around this uh, HI, uh, AI outbreak. And what we found is that when we checked in the cars of several people from the poultry industry, yeah, that inside the cars, we could find AI, okay? So people were very cautious. They left the car outside the, the farm. They were taking on the boots, they were taking the clothes, taking the shower, okay? And they didn't realize that the virus was already able to contaminate inside the car, okay? So very important, cars outside, but also inside can carry diseases, okay? So many possibilities of having transmission of um, disease. Principles of good biosecurity, we want to separate high and low risk animals and environments. Yeah? Um, we want to reduce general infection pressure by all in or out. Yeah? Um, uh, but try to differentiate the transmission routes from um, high risk transmission routes to low risk transmission routes. Okay, and a low risk yeah, is a person bred. High risk is of course live animals. And again, I refer to mycoplasma spiking uh, breeder flocks uh, with males that are positive for MG, MS is a very often the reason of introducing mycoplasma in a breeder flock. We have two components of biosecurity. Okay, so we have external biosecurity that bring that means bringing a disease from outside to the inside. Most people will think of biosecurity in um, this. Um, um, I have to close this. Um, um, I think of this when they talk about biosecurity. Okay, that's of course crucial, but also don't forget that within a farm. The internal biosecurity, that is the one that they don't like because they have to change the boot from one house to the other one. They have to change the clothes from one house to the other one. It takes time, yeah? but it's very important to reduce spreading on a farm. And of course, the larger the farm, okay, the more crucial the internal biosecurity will become. Okay.
So best way for internal biosecurity is all in the loud, eh? makes good cleaning and disinfection possible and also avoids different ages, okay? Rules are for everybody, but if you have a book like this on biosecurity for your farm, you know that they will not follow this book because you make it complicated. You have to set simple rules. This is the responsibility of the manager. Don't blame the worker. If you have made the rules too complicated, they will not follow. You should not blame your staff. You should blame yourself. Rules must be practical. They should be motivating. They should be simple and they should be recorded. Okay? And set realistic goals and motivate people. And then you can do regular independent checks and audits. I see very often, I see managers from their desk eh, being angry with the staff. They should follow the biosecurity. Okay. But if they have not set the rules as practical and motivating, then again, eh, it will be hard for the staff to follow the rules. So that's the responsibility, responsibility of the management. Vaccination. Vaccination are used in order to prevent disease, to occur or minimize the effect, not always to completely keep out the disease. There's a lot of misconception, confusion, where people say, oh, I used the vaccine against infectious bronchitis and I can still pick up with the PCR, I can still pick up the field strain. Yes, yes. Not always the vaccine is supposed to 100% eliminate the pathogen. It is one of the, the means to keep out diseases and minimize the effect of the diseases, but maybe not all the vaccines are able to always stop the disease 100%, okay? What they do is they stimulate an adaptive immune response by exposing the body to the whole or part of the infectious agent in the less pathogenic or non-pathogenic form, okay? Non-pathogenic is typically something what you have with dead, inactivated pathogens, okay? Less pathogenic, typically will stimulate the immune system in a better way because it's usually a living organism that is simulating the normal route of infection. And that helps to have a good immune response. Eh? A good immune response starts with a correct vaccine and a correct dose and healthy birds. But that's the textbook. Sometimes we have to vaccinate in situations where birds are not healthy. Okay? And all these factors here will play a role um, in order to achieve a good immune response. So remember, we vaccinate to prevent and reduce uh, diseases, sometimes to comply with re legal requirements. Sometimes we have to vaccinate, although I prefer not to. For instance, Newcastle disease. If I know I will not have Newcastle disease or the risk is very low, I prefer not to vaccinate because I know my Newcastle disease vaccine will cause a vaccination reaction, will cause a damage of or loss of performance. Okay. So um, very few vaccines protect 100%, remember that. So we have live vaccines, we have inactivated vaccines, and recently you also have recombinant vaccines where we use one vaccine as a vector and we genetically modify them to also express antigens from other viruses or, or bacteria, okay? And then we also have immunocomplex uh, uh, vaccines, but that would bring us a little bit far. We have different ways of applying. Remember what I said at the start, that the root of infection will define very often if a certain bird will become sick or subclinically losses or just immunized. And that's also how we play with different uh, vaccines, in ovo, eye drop, drinking water, spray. And usually when we build up immunity, we'll start with a coarse spray that goes to the upper respiratory tract and then we will have finer and finer sprays to go deeper to the respiratory tract. Recently, we are using more and more gel type of uh, vaccination uh, application, and some vaccines are done in the feet. We can inject eh, intramuscular subcutaneous, or we can also use a wing wrap vaccination. So they are crucial in the poultry sector. Okay, so, um, um, but you have to realize that for the best possible production, it's critical that every part of the chain, from production, from the pharmaceutical company, until the application, everything is done correctly. I see a lot of people that focus on checking, ah, do you think the supplier did a good job? Usually, yes, okay? Usually the problem is with the application, not with the vaccine, okay? There's no ideal vaccination program. It's always a balance between its benefits and costs. 
and you have to re-evaluate it because every few months the situation is changing. Okay, and other thing is uh, uh, important to drive improvements in the whole process. Um, another thing that you have to realize is that you can use, so you can dilute your pathogens, you can use vaccination, but you can also boost your immune system. Okay, and then you don't protect against one disease only, you can protect to a range of diseases. And I use that a lot more than the average person in the boot industry, I noticed. Yeah? A lot of people don't realize how valuable the fact is that we can train the immune system by nutritional sources. Yeah? I use a lot beta glucans, it could be algae based uh, uh, products. Yeah? But immunoboosters are really underestimated in a tool to improve your efficacy of your vaccines and also the resistance to diseases. So have a look at that. Eh? Um, remember, um, going with beta glucans, for instance, into uh, uh, immunity boosting will give you a better uh, seroconversion of vaccines, but also a better resistance to many diseases. Again, look to infectious bronchitis, but also AI, Newcastle disease, all these viruses not only attack the respiratory tract, but are also present in the intestinal tract. That means that you can train the immune system while you don't have a lot of damage because the respiratory tract is not attacked. Yeah? But you can train the immune system if you have a good immune capacity boosted by beta glucans in the feed uh, or in the drinking water, whatever, um, uh, uh, by the, the, the presence of the immune system in the intestines, you can solve also a lot of issues with respiratory um, uh, tract. Uh, again, a lot of examples, a lot of products are on the market, uh, um, um, but I already uh, mentioned this, okay? So, eliminating the pathogen is treatment. Uh, uh, for fungi, we use fungicides. Aspergillosis, uh, we, we, we can use um, um, uh, products uh, that eliminate the fungi. Parasites, yeah, we have some respiratory diseases eh, like, uh, like Syngamo strachea, we will use a parasite. Virus, we don't have antiviral products. We know that. Even in humans, we don't have. Oh, we have very limited access. That's our big frustration. So here we have to work with vaccines, right? And for bacteria, we can use antibiotics. Antibiotics are, in fact, the most uh, common treatment um, products that we are using for uh, uh, controlling respiratory diseases, but please use them in a prudent and intelligent way. I use sensitivity testing a lot, okay? I use um, uh, sensitivity testing for E. coli, but also for mycoplasma, also for, for, for ORT. Yeah? And I will sometimes not do it for every treatment, if it is mycoplasma or ORT, but from time to time, I will make a small study to make a formularium. Eh? A formulary means, okay, for E. coli, you can, you can do it. You can do it for every outbreak, for every treatment, you can do a sensitivity test. It's very easy, okay? But for some pathogens, it's not so easy because you need long time to grow the bacterium. But then making formularia will give you a list of the most sensitive antibiotics in general, in this region for a certain disease, for instance, ORT, and then going from very sensitive to more resistant. Then you know next time the first one that you will take from the shelf antibiotic, you know which one to take. All right. If you can use narrow spectrum antimicrobials, they're usually uh, it's better. Avoid your critical antimicrobials, your broad spectrum, your fluoroquinolones. Eh? Don't use them if the other ones still are effective. Try to save them for the moment that you know the others are not working. And you know that because you can do your sensitivity testing. Okay. Choose antimicrobials that reach your respiratory tract. Eh? Um, understand the best way of application. For instance, colistin has a good anti-E. coli effect, but can it reach your respiratory tract? Okay, not by oral route, but maybe you can spray it. Correct dosage, don't confuse. Eh? Tilusin, very important macrolides. Eh? Um, um, for intestinal issues, 20 milligrams per kilogram live weight is enough. But for mycoplasma, you have to go higher usually, okay? Again, that depends a little bit on the sensitivity of the strains, etc. But check your dose rates, okay? Duration. Some diseases eh, need longer treatment than others. For instance, ORT is a very good example. If you make a study, 
and you treat three days for ORT or five days, you have a huge improvement of the five days compared to uh, three days. With some other diseases, three days is enough. Okay, Product quality, very important. It is not because it is mentioned on the back or on the bottle that the percentage of active is there, that it is really there. Eh? There are some poor quality products on the market, eh? so check your active percentage, okay? Um, contaminants, we see that some sources eh, uh, contain contaminants and some formulations have poor stability, especially when we took at uh, uh, use in drinking waters for uh, longer times, okay? Some common mistakes for antibiotic treatments are application, eh? so um, solubility. Some people just put a powder in there that has poor solubility. Eh? Sometimes they're already using other products. So you have incompatibilities in terms of water treatments, okay? Biofilms, especially when you work with nipple drinking lines, biofilms are very often preventing the antibiotic to, to be absorbed by the animals because the antibiotics get stuck in the biofilm, all right? By the way, it reduces your efficacy but it also increases the risk for residues because this antibiotics then can be slowly released from the biofilm and give you residue issues. All right. So, so these are a couple of common mistakes that I want to stress. Most people will use a lot of antibiotics uh, when they do respiratory disease uh, control. What they sometimes forget, yeah, it's like with the beta-glucans or with the immunostimulation that I mentioned, yeah, sometimes they forget about that. Another thing, another trick that I want to share today with you, something that I, I use a lot, is I do a lot of symptomatic treatments. And it's strange, it seems that we have forgotten. We do it for, for other types of animals or for humans. We would not forget to take anti-inflammatory, antipyretic, analgetic drugs. In chickens, sometimes we see they are suffering. And we don't do anything. We just say, oh, let's put an antibiotic in there. Think of that inflammation. And um, think also of that, um, yeah, that decongestion, freeing the airways, using mucolytic expectorants. We do that ourselves as humans, right? Reduce oxidative stress and stimulate his appetite. Make sure the birds keep eating and drinking. Sometimes we cannot do too much about a viral infection. It's too late. We should have used vaccines. But we can still do this kind of things to make sure the flock can deal with it as good as possible. Okay? Um, inflammation is very important because immune system is a huge consumer for um, um, energy and protein. And also, eh, if you can reduce your uh, inflammation and immune reaction, you can stop the reduction in feed intake you can reverse the negative energy balance. And very important for us in the broiler sector, yeah, we can stop the breakdown of muscle tissue because if we don't have feed intake and you have an inflammation, yeah, um, your muscles will not grow anymore, but even worse, you will lose muscle. And we are selling muscle, right? That's the meat that we talk about. Yeah? And of course, it will cause an increase of, uh, perf uh, of the feed conversion rate, so an impact on uh, performance. Very short. What can we use? We can use anti-inflammatory NSAIDs. Eh? Um, um, so that is something that I use a lot. Sometimes they are not registered in all countries, but aspirin is uh, very um, um, common. Eh? I also use quite a lot of uh, ketoprofen. Uh, if I may, in some uh, indications, I can use this. Uh, that are the things that I can use. Underlighted eh? expectorants. Eh? Um, uh, expectorants will, and, and, and I should go to, to a little bit the core here of a tracheal um, um, cell line, you will see there are what we call the microvilli on top of the epithelial cells in the respiratory tract. You will see like this little, little cilia, and these little cilia, they usually, eh, they are going to, you see this, this black dots here, they will usually take like dust particles that can contain virus or bacteria, they will take them and they will, wash these pathogens out of the trachea. Now what happens if we have a problem um, with an infection, okay, and mycoplasma, for instance, is a good example to show that this can, uh, uh, that, that can be caused by, by mycoplasma or sometimes by, by air quality, yeah, by ammonia, yeah, is that the cilia are affected and that is creating 
the mycoplasma is paving the way for the E. coli because when the, the cilia are affected by the mycoplasma, there will be a thick mucus and they will not move freely anymore. And so all the E. coli that is inhaled, because there's a lot of E. coli, E. coli is coming from the gut. It's in the environment, in the dust. And then when this dust is inhaled, normally the E. coli is washed out again, but when the mycoplasma is present, eh, it will remain in respiratory tracts. Eh? You can influence that process by using this expectorant. And expectorant, you have some medications, uh, medications eh, that are registered in some countries um, based on bromexidine. Eh? But also we know, and we know that from, from human medicine, that you also can use some herbs and essential oils in order to help you with um, that expectorant um, uh, sweetening effect on the airways. Eh? By the way, some herbs and essential oils also have antioxidant properties have more an impact on gut health. Yeah? Some will stimulate that appetite, we also like. Yeah? So some of them have more effect on the intestinal tract, but also some of them have an effect on the respiratory tract. So uh, have a look at that as well, okay? I don't go too much in detail, we don't have time, yeah? but I give you some examples. Maybe one of the best uh, known examples are uh, eucalyptus um, um, and the Melissa oil. Yeah? Um, containing yeah, menthol as an anti-viral um, uh, and um, um, airway opening um, product. Okay, I go uh, for the end of the presentation. Eh? I just want to share with you a case. Yeah? Can you have a look at this and make me a suggestion of what this can be? Okay, so what I do, if I see a case like this, I look, I look to the birds. I see frothy eyes, too much fluid. Yeah? You cannot see the nose here, but I can tell you, the nose will be dirty because of the flow. We see a bird gasping for air, extending the neck position to facilitate breathing. It's a broiler farm with reduced feet intake, swollen heads, bloody nasal discharge, mortality 15%. What will I do? I start by putting my list of differential diagnoses. What is the most common mistake that veterinarians make? They will do a necropsy and they will sample with PCR, serology, histology. What will they do? They will try to confirm what they think based on their clinical examination to confirm that this is the case. You say, yeah, that's logic, right? No, it's not logic. The logic is that you do your additional sampling to rule out what you think it is not especially for respiratory disease, this is so important because what I explained to you at the start of the presentation is that usually the problem is not coming along. I see so many veterinarians that say, oh, I, I know it's, I know in this case, for instance, eh, I know it is ELT. Eh? I know it's ELT, so let me take a PCR to confirm it. No, what he should do or she should do is you take your other samples to check if IB is involved, TRT is involved, POX, ORT, E. coli, what other things are involved, Newcastle, AI. Okay. That is a very common mistake that I see. Okay, this is a little bit an easy case yeah, because if you see this kind of uh, trachea, you already know that from the macroscopic lesions, ILT is going to be um, uh, involved. What we like to do here also, we can, we can do a lot of things to confirm it for sure. We can take histopathology. We have a very specific intranuclear inclusion body in um, the cells that we can recognize with uh, histopathology. We can also do PCR uh, with sequencing. Then we can um, indicate if we have a relation to vaccine strains or field strains. Today, we have a lot of PCRs that we can go uh, and use to make sure that you are dealing with a vaccine strain or a field strain. Okay, in the past we had PCRs that says, yes, there is a virus present. Is it a field strain or a vaccine strain? I don't know, it just says that it's present, okay? Today, I always standard, almost will ask also to my lab people, I want to have the sequence and I will check, is this vaccine strain or is it field strain, okay? So anamnesis uh, can then follow, uh, you vaccinated with a live vaccine, um, was a new vaccination teams uh, dealing, uh, was there a bad hygiene on the farm? Eh? ILT, yeah, it's an interesting, um, uh, uh, and I just want to go a little bit deeper because this is a, uh, this case study uh, is ILT. Eh? This is an envelope DNA, DNA virus. Um, yeah, 
uh, incubation of six to 12 days, infections limited to upper respiratory tracts. Uh, so um, we have all this information in different um, uh, sessions of training sessions of vet works um, that you can uh, also follow. Eh? Um, usually we have an infection limited to the upper respiratory tract. Uh, remember this is a herpes virus, so that means that you could have a pop-up of a reactivation shedding in stress situations later on. We also know this from other um, uh, um, yeah, cases of herpes uh, uh, virus. So control and prevention, key factors in control, early diagnosis, rapid communication to all stakeholders, biosecurity, Hygiene, disinfection, quarantine, birth and incubation, vaccination. Um, in this case, we can use live attenuated vaccines, but be careful uh, because you have um, you have uh, embryo uh, origin and you have tish, uh, tissue culture origin. Uh, um, uh, ILT live viruses, the ones that are from embryo origin, have more um, possibility to reverse to virulence. Uh, and then recently we also have virus, um, vector viruses uh, that can also generate um, uh, immunity partially at least to uh, ILT. So conclusion for treatment of respiratory problems, prevention, management of environment, vaccination, immune boosting, antimicrobial treatments, eh, remember to take sensitivity testing, and then have symptomatic treatments, eh, anti-inflammatory, pain relief, comfort, mucolytic open airways, general boost the appetite so the birds keep eating so that they, they can also feed the immune system to fight the pathogen, but also they keep growing uh, in order to uh, reach that slaughter uh, uh, weight as uh, soon as possible. Eh? And with that, eh, I would like to conclude this short webinar. As you can realize, I can imagine, we can talk of all the different diseases for a very long time. Eh? Uh, we didn't have the time today to do that, but um, uh, in one hour, I hope that I was able to share with you some basic views on respiratory disease. So um, I would like to uh, to stop here, and um, uh, you can always contact me. Uh, you can see my email address, or you can contact me through our friends of uh, of Provet, eh? and I'm also happy to answer a couple of questions if you would have uh, some. Right. Thank you, thank you, Martin. It was very nice presentation. You have covered almost all the problems whatever we are facing now in india uh, thank you for that and uh, thank you for the questions also so now uh, i would like to uh, have few questions right yes. so what is the age most uh, prone for the getting the respiratory diseases yeah um, that depends on the the the, the, the pathogen huh? uh, age i'm not... asking age Age, yeah, I know that uh, depending on the pathogen, uh, yeah. you will have um, uh, a difference between viral pathogens. It can be very early. Yeah? And, and a good example here is, is a vaccine um, uh, viruses. Yeah? So we can have a um, vaccination reaction at eight, nine days of age. Okay. Uh, usually the viral uh, challenges come earlier yeah? and then they are followed by the bacterial ones. Yeah? Like mycoplasma, like E. coli, like ORT, we typically will see that from 21 days onwards. Eh? It's quite rare to have it as a respiratory issue. Of course, you can have um, omphalitis and so on uh, earlier um, uh, with, with E. coli, but usually for the respiratory um, pathogens, the bacteria will follow after 21 days of age. The viral ones can be um, preceding them, and very often, people will see the bacterial ones because they see mortality. I see something in 24 days and they don't see anymore that the initial problem was this uh, viral challenge that maybe happened already at 15 days or, or 14 days, okay? This is for broilers. Eh? Um, for breeders, layers, yeah, we are immunizing them. Eh? We are immunizing them with extensive vaccination programs. So usually we will have the, the, the majority of the problems in the reading phase. If you still have problems in the, in, the, in, the, in the production phase, that could be because you have not done a good vaccination program, but also it could be that we have a problem of maintaining a good local immunity by birds that are getting older. Right? Because the local immunity is the one that will disappear uh, the earliest. I give you an example, Newcastle disease, infectious bronchitis, if you have pressure in your production flocks, a good idea is to repeat 
with a live vaccine from time to time to boost your local immunity to keep out field strains as much as possible. Be careful. Don't start doing your spray vaccination um, or your drinking water vaccination live with your laying flocks eh, where you make a big gap between the last application of live vaccine and a new one. If you, you have 15 weeks that you wait, you, you vaccinated last time at, at 18 weeks and the next time you vaccinate is 33 weeks, you can cause issues with egg production. Okay, It's much better to leave a gap of four to six weeks only. So last time you vaccinated um, at 18 weeks, well, repeat it at four, 24 weeks, 30 weeks, then you have a lot less risk of uh, facing these problems of um, impact of your vaccine on your um, uh, egg production. Okay, so there's a couple of tricks to, uh, to keep in mind, but it really depends on the pathogen when you will see your highest uh, pressure, infection pressure, okay? Thank you. Uh, uh... Now, this is uh, in summer or in uh, other uh, time period also. What we are facing, uh, we are facing the outbreaks of uh, low pathogenic avian influenza, LPA, and after that, followed by CRD, like uh, mycoplasma galeseptica. Yeah, yeah. So, how to control it or how to reduce the mortality and uh, drop in egg production? And um, so, and, and okay. Um, yeah, AI. You, I don't think you have a, you have vaccines of uh, for AI. And, no, and, no. And, and, okay, you don't have vaccines. Okay, we in some countries we have. Then of course we will use uh, um, AI vaccines. Eh? Um, um, a trick is if you don't have uh, licensed vaccines is, is to look at uh, autogenous vaccines. Uh, but but uh, but uh, that's also not easy to to produce for AI. Um, so in this case, your Control of your mycoplasma is the low hanging fruit, okay? So you have to focus on taking away the mycoplasma challenge because the AI on itself, it's not, I don't like to have AI in my flocks, okay? But if you only have the AI without the mycoplasma, you will have solved the majority of the problem, okay? So focus on your mycoplasma and with mycoplasma control, you can, you can consider vaccination, you can consider antimicrobials, but the biggest advantage that we have today on mycoplasma control is that we have good monitoring tools. In the past, we didn't have, okay? In the past, yeah, we could use an antimicrobial, eh? but we didn't know how often should we use it. Should we use it every four weeks, every six weeks? What dose? Is it working? Is it resistant? Is it not resistant? When is the first infection happening? Today, and we were, we were limited with our information because you have to use serology. And the serologic, the seroconversion against mycoplasma is very variable, depending on the strain, depending on the type of birds, etc. Serology is a very poor way of detecting very early the mycoplasma. Much better is to work with a PCR. And with the PCR, you can do something else. You can sequence your strain of mycoplasma. And if you sequence the strain of mycoplasma, you will be able to understand the relation between different strains in a certain region. And if you see everywhere in this place, you see the same strain popping up, then you know somebody is distributing the strain in the farms. Okay? If you see a lot of different strains popping up in the farm, then you know it's the external. So that, that the first one was a problem of internal biosecurity. The second one, yeah, is going to be um, a problem of external biosecurity. Okay, so try to focus on your mycoplasma um, uh, if you don't have tools to um, deal with your AI. Now, for your AI part, of course, you can boost your immune system as much as possible and try to, to cope with the infection with your symptomatic treatments. All right? Oh, right. Uh, fine, thank you. Uh, the, another question I would like to take is... Uh, uh, about differential diagnosis between Newcastle disease and LPA. Major points, maybe two, three major points. How to differentiate? Between Newcastle and low pathogenic AI? Low, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's really um, a, a tough question because your 
two diseases have a really can really sometimes difficultly be uh, differentiated. Eh? How, one trick that you could use uh, is the presence with Newcastle disease of um, bleeding at the um, in your uh, stomach yeah? and also the presence of greenish um, diarrhea and uh, also your sh uh, shecal tonsil uh, inflammation. Yeah? That is indicative in the direction of a Newcastle disease more than of a, your low pathogenic AI. Okay, so, so, but again, I prefer if I have a suspicion it could be AI or Newcastle disease, I will not take any risk by thinking that I as a clinician know the truth. I will check myself. Uh, even if I think it is Newcastle disease, I will still take my PCR and I will check because maybe the two are present. Okay. So again, as a clinician, a good clinician questions himself all the time. Okay, so even if I see the clinical science to tell me, I think it's more um, AI type. Uh, okay, you can also look at the, 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 the neurological symptoms, for instance, with, with, the, with Newcastle disease. Uh, um, but I don't want to fool myself. I will check myself. Okay, I don't want to be the big guy that says, I can see from a distance what disease is this. No, I will check myself by taking um, um, my... Differential diagnosis, I will confirm it by doing a lab test. And then I'm sure. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, uh, just now, uh, before I also discuss with Nifalikani and our conversation also, we are facing a huge problem of ILT. Uh, typically, it starts during growing. And uh, uh, sometimes uh, even we see outbreaks uh, due at early lay also. So or point of lay or in early layer or young layers, you can say, how to control it? Yeah, um, can, I, it, can I ask you a question back? Do you vaccinate um, um, in drinking water or how do you vaccinate? And it's with, no, with, uh, with what kind of vaccine do you vaccinate? Uh, uh, Which one do you have available? Yeah, yeah. Officially, we don't have any uh, vaccine available here. Officially, I'm saying you can understand. Uh, I can but, understand. Uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, people uh, are preferring uh, like chicken bro based vaccine. Uh, previously, they used to go with uh, drinking water. First dose was eye drops followed by drinking water. But uh, last from one, one and a half, or you can say two years, people have stopped through giving by drinking water. They are going by only eye drops. Mm -hmm. Well, the eye drop is better. Um, no, what I said earlier is that your um, uh, chicken embryo origin um, viruses, vaccine viruses, they have a risk of reversing to, to virulence. Now, the reverse to virulence happens when you don't have a perfect vaccination. That means that some birds are vaccinated properly, some of the population are not. So what happens is the ones that are vaccinated, they will excrete the virus. It starts to multiply in the non-vaccinated animals, and then you have the risk of reversion of virulence. Okay. So that could be, um, and we, I had some cases where we could demonstrate black on white that this was vaccine strain origin problem. Okay. So if you want to know, you can send me a, a swap with a strain and I will, I will tell you. Okay. No problem. Um, so, but your, your eye drop vaccination is for sure uh, better, but if you can use a, um, a, a tissue culture origin, uh, that's going to help you. Yeah, I know you don't have good availability of vaccines there for uh, ILT. Um, so in the ideal world, then, uh, yeah, you, you, well, you don't have an ideal situation. Okay? Um, but if you have some vaccination, I prefer the, the, the eye drop. Um, yeah, if you, if you optimize your vaccination program, yeah, um, it's really, it should not be any problem um, with, uh, with ILT eh? because there's a good cross protection amongst, uh, amongst the strains if you have a good application. Eh? So double check your, your, um, your uh, vaccination and do some general immunity boosting. That is what I would recommend to do on the short term. Fine. Right. If at all we are doing uh, ILT as a preventive or in phase of the outbreak also, vaccination, eye drop, 
how much uh, uh, yeah uh, or how many days gap should we maintain for other live uh, respiratory vaccines yeah. like nd or ib yeah yeah um we we sometimes i sometimes i i have a high pressure of ilt i don't have the luxury to <laughs> to to take this into consideration eh? so um, so sometimes we have early outbreaks of ILT with young birds. And then um, uh, I have to vaccinate them in the middle of my Newcastle disease or IB vaccination program. So I don't like it, but sometimes that's life. That's my first comment I want to share. Yeah? But you're right. If you have the luxury that you have um, time uh, enough, um, I like to have minimally two weeks between my live ILT vaccination and other live viral vaccines to avoid vaccination reactions, to give the animals the chance to react and to have the immune system to process uh, the virus and overcome it and become a uh, strong immune. Minimally two weeks, but I prefer even four weeks. But you know, Dr. Aja, you will know together with me that um, in this identity poultry production, sometimes it's not easy to to find four weeks of space. But ideally, if you ask me the question, just technically four weeks, minimally two weeks. Good, right, fine, thank you. Uh, another major problem we are facing in India here is uh, mycoplasma. So uh, let it be uh, layers or let it be breeders. What should be the policy? Uh, like uh, it should be a vaccination or vaccination coupled with uh, uh, chemicals okay so because uh, you, because you before some, yeah sorry sorry to disturb uh, you can because, you can find some nice work um, some presentations i've been given on, on, on mycoplasma um, that goes a little bit more in detail because because <laughs> this is okay. this is easy questions but i can talk uh, two hours uh, only on this topic oh, okay. Um, okay. but in short eh? yeah in short remember, i want in short you remember you have four tools to fight mycoplasma. One, biosecurity. Two, diagnostics, PCR. Three, vaccines. Four, antimicrobials. I have people who say, oh, I prefer to use vaccines. I have other people who say, oh, I believe. No, I don't believe. I'm using, in all my programs, I'm using the four cornerstones for mycoplasma control. Okay, so um, I don't have a preference of one or the other. Obviously, if you work with a live mycoplasma vaccine, you need the birds to be free of mycoplasma before the vaccine can do the good job. Mm, okay, yeah. so what can you do? You have to use antimicrobials, all right? Okay, how do I know if my infection pressure is low enough to do vaccination because I'm using my diagnostics and I'm measuring. I am measuring my flocks at four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, 16 weeks. I differentiate with my sequencing to understand is this one strain or do I pick up this several strains? Because if I pick up several strains, I will not start vaccinating. I know that I have repeatedly influx of of mycoplasma, I know my low hanging fruit is the biosecurity, okay? So I use these four control tools to define the ideal program. Okay? And the ideal program yeah, will really depend on the situation, okay? But I'm using the four. So I'm using and vaccines and diagnostics and biosecurity and uh, antimicrobials, okay? Okay, right, thank you. Uh, the another uh, tricky question is uh, because, as you know, uh, tylosine phosphate uh, and uh, of course tartaric and lincomycin have almost same mode of action. Uh, can we use them concurrently? And why would you do that? Uh, no, so I I don't see I don't see the point. Uh, yeah, you uh, to to do that. So. Um, so you can do it, but why would you do it? Okay. Right. I, I don't like to, okay, I would know. I, I think I understand your question. Eh? Um, I don't like a 
use of antibiotics that doesn't allow you anymore to understand the effect. Okay, so in the good old days, let's say 30, 40 years ago, we were using a lot of what we call cocktails. You know the word cocktail, eh? It is, you take two, three different um, actives, you mix them together and you give them to the bird. You think, if it's resistant to this one, then the other one will still work. Eh? And um, at that moment, that was common practice. But I don't do it for the following reason. I'm wasting money because I want to find out which one is now working the best. At this moment, I go to understand first, what is my complex respiratory issue? Is it mainly the IB? Is it mainly the ILT? Is it the E. coli problem? Is it the mycoplasma problem? Is it the ORT problem? Then I define if there's a bacterial component involved. I define sensitivity, okay? I always do that. Sometimes for easy pathogens, I will do it for every treatment again. For more difficult pathogens, I will try to make an estimate based on a certain region, okay? And then I choose the one that works best, okay? The other things are just gambling. I don't like gambling, okay? Only for, uh, for, uh, for the sport, but not with my chickens, okay? So try to unravel the complex, respiratory complex that you are facing and then define what antimicrobial is going to be best. If you then have two anti, um, if you have two bacteria that go together in the flock and you need two antimicrobials to deal with them, I'm happy, but I know what I'm doing. But I will not just as a standard procedure, mix two antibiotics in a program, okay? Maybe that's a little bit easier answer than the previous one I said, why would you do that, okay? Yeah, yeah. thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Uh, 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 like, can I take uh, some more questions? Are you comfortable? I am Martin? comfortable, yes, Fine. absolutely. Right, thank you, thank you, thank you for that. So, uh, how, like, uh, on the base, if we want to, uh, diagnose on the base of facial swelling, how to differentiate diagnosis or what are the pathogens maybe involved in that? On I, the just, of... I have a little disturbance in my, uh, in my uh, microphone. Can, can you just repeat? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah fine. fine. Uh, so there are so many uh, like uh, conditions where we get facial swelling. Okay, facial swelling, yeah. Uh, how to differentiate or the differential diagnosis for different involved pathogens? Yeah, um, Swollen head uh, syndrome, um, um, it sounds easy. Eh? You would think very easily that if you look in literature that we are dealing with a TRT eh? um, infection. But you have to be careful. Eh? Uh, you, it's very suggestive for, uh, for a viral um, um, yeah, implication. But you have to realize that um, sinusitis can be caused by different types of pathogens, and again, also by different combinations of pathogens. Yeah. So I, I have the same answer like I gave before. Eh? Um, I will probably, I will suspect if it's a typical case of a swollen head syndrome, eh, where you have an infraorbital uh, swelling, eh, you, you will see that it is really, uh, it's not really the eyes that are, but it's, it's surrounding the eyes. Um, but I will try to confirm that uh, by taking a, um, a, typically I would take a PCR to check for um, differential diagnosis of ORT, TRT. Eh? I would include mycoplasma. I would include IB. Um, um, and then, of course, uh, based on that result, I will try to understand what was going on. Okay. Yeah, right. Thank you. Uh, very interesting question. Uh, what is the basic difference between COVID-19 and uh, avian coronavirus? Okay. Um, they are nephews from each other. Okay. So um, I now don't recall exactly the percentage of um, similarity that they have, um, but they are in fact behaving very similar. So they have a different sequence. Yeah, but remember, 
and the coronavirus eh, IB strains, they are sometimes very much alike eh, in, in, in sequencing, eh, but still sometimes across protection is not, um, is not, uh, is not 100%. Eh? That's why we have different vaccines for, for Massachusetts strains, for um, um, QX strains, etc. So even within the avian uh, coronaviruses, we have uh, small variations that prevent the animals to cross protect uh, or to be cross protected after vaccination. Okay. Now, for me, the two viruses, uh, one in humans and one in animals, although genetically they are quite different, what we see is that they behave very similar. Eh? So um, they behave similar in terms of uh, transmittability. They also behave similar in causing uh, both these um, problems in, in the respiratory tract, but they can also be transmitted in the intestinal tract. Yeah? So, uh, so um, but the main difference is, of course, that, that, that the, um, the host cells where the virus can attach upon, yeah, the mechanism is going to be very similar, but one can only infect uh, humans and even uh, some some uh, some animals uh, like like in cats that has been shown in ferrets it has been shown that this uh, COVID-19 can can multiply in the cells which is not a case for uh, the coronavirus of um, uh, chicken they can they cannot do that and vice versa eh? so it is uh, the way that these viruses can attach to the host cells eh? Um, also, it's a very similar one. The, the, the type of the cell uh, uh, is not compatible for one and the other virus. Okay. Right. But a funny question, and it's yeah. Right. Fine. Thank you. Uh, the another question is uh, like uh, we are using so many uh, chemicals for as antimicroplasma, maybe of fluoromethylene group or uh, uh, for macrolide group, coupled with uh, OTC oxytetracycline or chlorotetracycline how to uh, effectively rotate them? What should be the rotation policy? Well, um, I, if you don't have any diagnostic tools, uh, I would go for a six months rotation, okay? But I don't like to say this because I don't give support if I don't use diagnostics. Okay, so what I do is um, any program that I'm doing where I include antimicrobials for mycoplasma, I will use PCR monitoring to define efficacy of my drug. Okay, so that means that if I start a treatment and I take a PCR after I finish my treatment and I still pick up my mycoplasma that means that or i have resistance or my dose was not high enough so i will and, and the other way around as well yeah, i mentioned 100 milligrams per kilogram live weight for tylosin yeah there's some strains that that you don't need to uh, use 100 milligrams per kilogram live weight so what i would do in this case is i would start my treatment i take my pcr i will use my pcr after my treatment and i will check if it's gone i can try to lower my dose Okay, I can lower my dose and see if the, the PCR remains negative at a lower dose. I know it's working. So why should I give double the dose, double the cost? Okay, the same with the interval and the other way around. Yeah? If I see that my product is not working, I will try at a higher dose or I can switch my molecule. Yeah? But I know I have to do something. The same with the interval. If I see that my infection pressure is very high and I can see that after my treatment, after four weeks, my PCR is positive already, then I know my interval was too long, okay? If I see it's still negative, you know what? I will try my next interval to be five weeks. If it still is negative, I know that my interval is long enough combined with the infection pressure that is around in the environment, okay? So, conclusion for me, I steer whatever I do with my, uh, the microbial treatments, I'm steering by using my diagnostic tools. In the past, we could not do that because in the past we had serology. Serology, it stays there, okay? You cannot see this, but with PCR, you have a fantastic tool to do a lot more intelligent programs than what we could do before, okay? Right, thank you.
now uh, we are getting a typical uh, problem in uh, uh, we are getting uh, vaccination reactions during the live vaccination program mm -hmm. how how to prevent it mostly we are getting a problem with uh, lasota strains whenever we are uh, uh, yeah. during the break. how to Las prevent it yeah so lasota strain is um is a very good strain for vaccination of uh, of newcastle um but you have to build up your immunity. Yeah. And how do you build up your immunity? Remember to use milder, for instance, clones, yeah. uh, or there's some, there's some other strains that can be, um, uh, let's say, less pneumotropic. They are more uh, replicating in the intestines. Yeah. Um, the ulcer strains, yeah. um, and you start with these vaccines, you give, it, you give it in a coarse spray so that you create already a basic um, immune reaction or immunity, immunity at the basic level before you start stepping up your Lasota, okay? And the moment that you use your Lasota, you make sure you have a couple of other vaccinations already ahead of that with mild strains and you step up your vaccination program. The biggest problem is that in some companies you don't have the time because you will have uh, your Newcastle um, really kicking in at 14, 15 weeks of age. Yeah? Um, yeah, that means that you have to use your Lasota as early as possible um, in order to be ahead of the field strain, okay? Now, a little trick that I can teach you is hydro vaccination okay if we apply the same vaccine in an eye drop compared to a fine spray compared to a core spray or the drinking water what we see is that the immune capacity increases a lot when we use hydro eh? um, some studies indicate um, with some vaccine and eh, that if you use an eye drop after two days you have a good immunity Whereas with drinking water, you need seven, eight days. Okay, so that means that that if you have to be really early with your protection, you could use your hydro vaccination at day one to accelerate that base immunity with a mild vaccine, allowing you to already at, at eight days or ten days to have a lasota used also in an eye drop, right? but with a quicker, um, yeah. It's not going to be perfect eh? because it's still too early. Eh? It's still too early. But maybe you can gain a lot of days eh? by doing uh, hydro vaccination. So your your route of application, so the choice of your vaccines is important, eh? but also the route of your vaccines is going to be very important. And obviously, you don't want complications with mycoplasma. Okay, if you have mycoplasma, you have to start with dealing with your mycoplasma because without that. So, uh, solving the mycoplasma, you will keep having problems uh, um, that are too high. So mycoplasma control is, so the, the, the type of vaccine, the application and mycoplasma control. These are the three tricks to, um, yeah, to limit or to improve the situation of vaccination reactions after La Sota. Yeah, uh, there is another question, like uh, when we use antimycoplasma drugs, uh, maybe along with uh, uh, broad spectrum antibiotics uh, or systemic antibiotics, uh, definitely there will be some disturbance in the microflora. Can we increase the dose of probiotics to control that or to prevent that? But you have to ask your probiotic supplier um, about sensitivity. Um, but you have to be careful, of course. Eh? They, they have to show you data. Um, usually, this, this, if this drug is killing the probiotic, uh, usually, I am not very optimistic in your uh, chances to increase that uh, that probiotic. But ask your supplier. Eh? So um, uh, it could be that you overwhelm uh, 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 that, that the antibiotic is not uh, 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 killing it anymore. But um, I don't think it's a good strategy, to be honest. So I would prefer you to have a good chat with your supplier and see what is the compatibility between the probiotic and antimicrobial to to be used. Um, for mycoplasma control, there's different types of uh, antimicrobials that can work. Eh? So just check if you have a, 
a yeah a good match between your antimicroplasma drug and your probiotic right thank you thank you very much and uh, i i i am regretful to the uh, other viewers uh, whose questions were not been answered we will answer them uh, personally because due to the lesser time available uh, because only 2 minutes remaining i am very much thankful to martin martin that was really wonderful uh, presentation uh, and you have covered all the insights and i thankful i'm thankful to the all the participants for their being patients for one and a half year uh, sorry hours so uh, thank you thank you very much so stephen uh, so over to you uh, thanks uh, thanks dr rajay uh, thanks dr martin your uh, presentation is engrossing and uh, your energy is infectious we actually feel <laughs> jealous of you so how you are so uh, enthusiastic about the subject you take so many presentations but your enthusiasm never wavers so uh, keep it up and uh, thanks for all the audience for being here uh, despite your hectic schedule there are many people who are unable to make it so keep watching our uh, uh, social media channels our youtube channel and our facebook pages so we'll uh, uh, have the recordings there so you can watch there thanks for uh, being here and uh, thanks dr rajay thanks dr martin have a good day everybody thank you thank so you. much have yeah. a good weekend everyone bye bye, bye, -bye. see you next bye -bye. time bye 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 bye, -bye. thank you everybody bye bye, bye, -bye.